wonderful. Thank you for coming and for putting up with our schedule difficulties. Um, it's a really busy day here at the McDonald, which is quite nice, actually. Um, we are really pleased to welcome our keynote speaker for the launch, um, Jago Cooper, who is carrying the Americas at the British Museum and is also quite well known for his BBC4 uh, series um, about the Inca. We um, have been working on this journal for almost a year now, I'd say. And one of the things, more than that, more than a year, that came up particularly at our conference and in the journal is uh, there are a lot of archaeologists and people in related disciplines who are working on climate change um, and how humans have dealt with changing environments. But one of the things that we really need to do is to work with um, broader sectors of the public, with other disciplines. So we really wanted to have a speaker who's quite good at getting um, his research about the interactions between society and climate and also is quite public about it. And somebody who has his own BBC uh, documentary series was a wonderful choice. Um, so we're really happy to have him here, and all of you as well. And just a final word, um, yeah, as Margaret said, um, Jago really incorporates a lot of the themes that embodied our journal edition and our conference, um, as well as the work of Claudia Converti, who, to whom this uh, journal edition is, is dedicated. Uh, she attended our conference and was um, suddenly taken from us in, in May, but she was doing extraordinary work out in the Amazon and was clearly very passionate about it and doing a lot through outreach. And we felt that his talk, uh, particularly you know, in, in the same region, um, really exemplified the work that she did. So. Um, we're really honored and humbled to be able to dedicate uh, the journal edition to, to Claudia. So, anyway, thank you, and let's all welcome Jacob Cooper. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Lovely to be here, and uh, lovely to get the stream of emails that we've exchanged over over the years. It's been good, and uh, I was lovely to say a few words about what is really a very interesting book. I had the great pleasure to read through it on Friday, and I was stunned by the diversity and range of interesting and thought-provoking papers. And it sort of took me back to my time when I was finishing my PhD, because that is the sort of moment that I got it really involved in climate change research for the first time. Time. And so I was transported back about 11 years. Uh, but one of the phrases which came out of the book that I particularly thought was, uh, was very strong was this one, which is that archaeology does have this unparalleled way uh, of looking at the long-term relationships between humans, climate and environment. And that, in a nutshell, is something that I still totally believe. And by the contributions in this book, I realised that there are a growing number of people who are now working towards this goal. And so what I thought I would do today was not really talk too much about my research, but really just focus on a couple of highlight thoughts around this topic and maybe tease out some conversations that we could perhaps have after the talk or any Q&A that you might want to have uh, about why archaeology is relevant and how we might frame it within a more interdisciplinary framework. For me, uh, is that looks like a terrible quality image. Um, I might change that image. Um, I converted this to a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm going to put it back into this one because that doesn't look good enough to me. Let's see if this is any better. Does that look any better? Any better? Yep. Okay, let's try that. Um, 2008, last year of my PhD, uh, I had been working in Cuba for six years during my PhD, doing a broad archaeological survey of a series of uninhabited islands off the North Cuban coastline, and broadly working on changes in settlement patterns and foodways of indigenous populations. Luckily for me, uh, a colleague from Canada was doing a paleoclimatic reconstruction of the same coastline, looking at the impacts of sea level change. So my PhD was putting together the impacts of climate change in northern Cuba on the indigenous population over a period of around 5,000 years. I thought it was very important work, and, uh, and I enjoyed doing it. And, uh, and that I'd worked a lot of it with this guy called Nelson, who was a local fisherman and who ran the boat. So we spent year, like, months, about three months a year for four years, doing field work with a whole big team from Cuba, going around these islands out and then coming back late at night. And it was in the end of 2008, when I was finishing my PhD, that we were getting one boat trip back with Nelson. And, uh, and Nelson turned to me and was like, so JK, you know, you do all this climate change research, you keep saying how important it is, but what is it that you actually do? And I was like, I gave him, you know, my usual spiel about, you know, researching food, looking at settlement patterns, and he was like, yeah, 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 but like, how 
is what you do actually useful for me? <laughs> and, and, and I was like, well, and I gave another bit of blurby spiel. And then he's like, well, look, you know, we do, we all know in Cuba that we have climate change. We have these massive hurricanes. We have these major issues with sea level rise. What is it that you can do? And for me, that moment was a real turning point in my career because I realized that there was very little that my research was contributing in a meaningful way to Nelson. And so when I came back, that moment sparked a very different chapter in my research. And it led on to a big postdoc that I ended up doing. But what I did when I came back was realize that I didn't know that much about climate change. I knew the generalities of it, I knew some of the science, but I thought if I'm really going to engage in what climate change is, I need to learn about what climate change is and how our climate systems operate and who are the people on the planet who are in charge of governing how we deal with climate change. So I got into the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change meetings and I read the entirety of the fourth assessment report, which was then recently published in 2008, from cover to cover. And at that moment, I was completely mind boggled by the situation on the planet. I knew generally that climate change is a bad thing, but reading the actual scientific data from all aspects of our planetary system to realise the sheer propensity for catastrophic failure that we now have in front of us, it was like quite a shock. I found it very shocking. And then the second shock I found was that when I started going to the IPCC meetings, um, no, there were no archaeologists there, uh, or if there were, they were very much marginalised. In fact, humans, in, as a rule, are mainly marginalised from conference and party meetings. It, these conversations are entirely dominated by economists, primarily. And, uh, and so occasionally I would pipe up with a sort of little human-style comment at some point, normally in the back of a very small side room where no one was really listening anyway. Uh, and, then, and then and you realise that the debate was in a very different place and that humans and archaeology as an entire discipline had a long way before it could engage meaningfully on, on a sort of world stage. And so there were some really great speakers that I would listen to in the auditorium, uh, one of whom was a man called Johann Rockström. Um, I don't know if anyone, how many of you have heard of Johann Rockström? One couple of people, Johann. So he was a rock star of his time back in 2008 and was a big founding partner of a thing called Future Earth, which has made, gained great traction now and is dominating a lot of our lives. Um, but he wrote a couple of great papers. One was called uh, Planetary Boundaries. And this sort of graph represents that sort of conceptualization of our planet with finite boundaries of our resources and looking at planetary systems in a, in a, in a global manner. And that, I think, is one of the first ways in which archaeologists are extremely adept. Because if there is one thing that our brains are trained to do during all of our archaeological training, it is to move between different spatial and temporal scale. And we can move between individual small household archaeology up to global patterns of cultural development. And we can move between small individual case studies of societal change up to meta-narrative understandings of human environment relationships. And that ability to transcend between scale is absolutely crucial. Because if we are going to have a meaningful engagement with the topic, we have to engage at this global scale. Because this is where the debate lies. So within these planetary spheres, we have the, uh, the hydrosphere. And you know we are hugely reliant on our ocean systems to absorb more than 90% of the radiative forcing of energy since the 1970 is absorbed within this oceanic mass. And we see at the coastline, as highlighted in some of the papers uh, here by Rachel, Rachel Rankin, we see how some of these coastline dynamics start to play out in terms of sea level pressures and coastal storm surges. And so the hydrosphere and how we start to look at um, interactions of water and land and small island communities uh, is a crucial one and one of which archaeologists are currently working uh, very closely as is the cryosphere. It's actually Rachel Rankin's paper on ice patches, uh, which looks at um, glacial melt zones all around the planet. And at a small scale, you come in at this fantastic ice patch walking, uh, where there's, these, the, there's a chapter which looks at current glacial melt, 
walks around the edge of glaciers as they're melting today to reveal artefacts that are being revealed for the first time in many, many thousands of years. Um, but it plays into this wider issue of glacial melt across the planet. And we had, I was chatting to someone earlier about the Himalayas um, and looking at some of the issues with glacial melt variability in the Himalayas. And last week I was in the Andes talking about glacial melt dynamics with uh, the Andes. And these are all issues in which we can start to see inter-regional dialogues at a global scale starting to operate at some of the impacts of things like cryosphere instability. And we can move into the biosphere. Another one of Johann Rockström's famous rock star phrases was that we are entering into the sixth great extinction of the planet, uh, which unfortunately is largely true. And, uh, and as Claudia Converti's paper shows up in the, her work in the Amazon, by looking at those issues of biodiversity loss within the Amazon and contemporary human uh, actors changing the Amazon, um, the Amazon uh, uh, ecology, she looked at long-term traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples to start to scale and understand some of that biodiversity loss within the Amazon and start to think about how we could start to reconstruct against it. But again, that's this sort of fourth sphere that you can start to see coming in. So all these sort of planetary systems in which we're moving between very different scales of archaeological data and then big planetary change, we're starting to see now being framed within this term as the book highlights of the Anthropocene. And I think it's a very useful term. I was teaching at the University of Leicester with Mark Williams and Jan Zelazovic when they did their big paper on the Anthropocene and how it should be defined. And as I'm sure all of you know, from a geosphere perspective, they have this golden spike, which they metaphorically look to locate at the moment when humans have so altered our planet as to be entering a new geological epoch. And then they debate, it's hilarious, because there's a load of geologists, and they're all debating about when humans have impacted the planet to such a dramatic effect. And, uh, and so they all have these big arguments about whether it should be uh, the moment that Columbus arrived in the Americas, or the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, or the first nuclear tests. And you can see them having this microcosm of debate within the sphere, missing the larger picture of the fact that humans on the planet are transforming it into a very dangerous direction. And so, what is it that archaeology can start to, to feed into? If we're going to take this message and take it on, what are the key aspects that we might think about taking up at that planetary level? How might we start to engage at a sort of systems level within some of those debates? For me, one of the best people to phrase the argument for this was called Peggy Nelson, Professor Margaret Nelson from Arizona State University, um, who has worked for many years in the southwest of the US. This is a region that is very famous for its work with climate change and archaeology, primarily because it has one of the best paleoclimatological records on the planet. This has been reconstructed by a whole series of uh, paleodendroclimatological cycles of trees that have been studied for the last 70 years that allow an annual banding of temperature and precipitation proxies for the whole of the southwest, as well as stream flow rates coming out of the Rockies down through Salt River, where you have annual flow rates of different rivers coming out of the Rockies. So this is a region of the southwest that, as in the past, as today, suffers from major droughts, and therefore water scarcity is a huge issue. So Peggy Nelson framed her research by saying that archaeologists play with experiments. Archaeology can't predict what the future will, uh, how humans will play out in the future um, of climate change on the planet, but what we can do is look at a, a huge myriad of different experiments that have played out in the past we can look at the dynamics of human climate environment relationships in case studies and thematically understand how they operate. And we can learn lessons and we can deconstruct assumptions that are very common in modern day policymakers. So the ancestral Puebloan communities of the Southwest play out many of these sort of experiments, these case studies. Water scarcity between sort of the 8th and the 14th centuries um, AD 
uh, in the southwest create major issues for a number of different ancestral Puebloan communities. You have the Hohokam, the Mimbres, the Zuni. Uh, this is the famous site of Mesa Verde up, on, up in Colorado. And each of these communities choose to tackle climate variability and the droughts in different ways. The Hohokam are extremely famous because they build what is uh, then the largest scheme of dams and irrigation in the Americas. They construct along the Salt River a huge system of dams. They come up with a technological solution to the issue of droughts, and they build this very, very elaborate dam system. <coughs> that dam system is extremely effective in mitigating against high-frequency uh, but low-level droughts throughout the, uh, the sort of the, the 10th to the 11th centuries. During that time, the Mimbres and the Zuni are having high mobility around the landscape. They're being forced to move and change as they go around the landscape. And the Hohokam are then seen as a sort of great case study of technological innovation and adaptation. However, uh, around 1365, a major flood comes down the Salt River in a one in 200 year event, and it wipes out the entirety of the dam and irrigation system on the Salt River, and it takes it out. And all of the population increase, which has grown in the Hohokam over those centuries before, leads to a massive catastrophic population decrease and the over-reliance on the technological solution to the perceived threat of the impacts of climate variability becomes a great weakness within the cultural development. And then Mimbres and Zuni are then seen as playing out in a more sustainable or resilient way by moving and adapting in different mechanisms. So this is just sort of, you know, as if you take that Peggy Nelson concept of an experiment, you can look at it as a way of thinking about what does technological solutions mean for dealing with climate change. Right now, if you go to the IPCC meetings, technology is always the main hope for the future. Be it iron, these ideas I have actually heard, iron filings being dumped in the oceans to create these algae blooms to allow to take up, soak up carbon dioxide, uh, giant mirrors reflecting off into space, firing cans of counter aerosols into the atmosphere. These sorts of technological solutions are meaningfully engaged with by policymakers as a, a, a quick fix. And I think archaeology is a great example in many case studies from around the world of showing how short-term solutions to short-term problems can increase vulnerability over the long term. But we're not short of technological innovations and adaptation. So this is um, uh, the Andes. Uh, and Andes, like many areas in the world, rely heavily on glacial meltwater for irrigation, particularly in highly arid parts of the rain shadows of the Andes. You rely on these water streams to come down, and these are currently highly vulnerable to change. In the Andes, we have large examples of major potential variation, both now and into the decadal future, um, that we have to examine. I'm looking at Matthew here and thinking to myself, I shouldn't be talking about this because he's going to know exactly what I'm talking about and I'm going to be exposed. <laughs> but, um, but So these are raised bed fields in uh, Bolivia. So this is a, a classic example of, uh, of applied archaeology as it used to be, uh, originating in the 1970s. This idea of applied archaeology, where you could take a technological innovation from the past and apply that wisdom to a current day situation. So I don't know how many of you already heard about raised beds, but, um, but these are abandoned in the landscape, particularly in the Titicaca Basin. Hundreds of square miles of these, these strange ridge and furrow uh, anomalies in the landscape. And a guy called Clark Erickson, amongst others, started to see them as an archaeologist and started to realise that they were a, an agricultural technological innovation that had been lost following European arrival in the region over centuries. And so he got together a team and started excavating out the old ancient technology of the raised beds. He dug down to create these little water channels, lifted up the earth and threw it on top, and then encouraged farmers to then grow within these, uh, within these sort of raised beds. And the initial results were extremely positive. You had high nutrient turnover by the movement of the soil. You had a mitigation of climate impact because the water warms up with the sun during the day and avoids frost damage at night. And it was heralded as a fantastic solution. And it is, right? I mean, you can come up with very clever technological um, uh, innovations from the past that we can access. But this is just a, a, a photograph of um, Alejandro Guaca from Lake Isla de Quil. And I, and I showed the image because 
what that innovation and technology missed in the Ericsson case is the need for a social structure underpinning any technological innovation in order to make it actually work. And the reality is that indigenous peoples of the Andes have moved on dramatically and been equally as dynamic as everyone else on the planet over the last 500 years. So how do you engage with a, a community to ad adopt a technology? And what happened was that over the years, when Clark would go back at the end of the season, he'd go back, uh, back up to the States, and then a little bit of motivation would be lost. And then there was no real underpinning of the labor required to keep that model going over long periods of time. And also, it's an innovation of scale. You need to open it up across whole valleys, across the, um, across the valley of the Alpha Planet for it to be functional and work well. And that's a huge labor resource which works. So here, I think archeology span has a huge amount to offer in terms of our understanding of the social constructs that are required for any innovation or technology to actually be implemented within society. You need to have, for want of an Americanism, a buy-in by people into any in innovation or idea. And my favorite example of this were the fog catchers, which I knew nothing about until I was on a plane <coughs> with someone going to a climate change congress. Where was it? It must have been, uh, must have been the, I think it was Resilience Alliance. It was the Resilience Alliance meetings in Arizona, um, which is all about resilience theory. And I sat next to this woman who was from the uh, uh, Department of Environment, in Institute of Environment in Oxford. And she was going over to talk about fog catchers, because these are an amazing innovation. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of them, but the, uh, you get these sheets and you can put them in the Atacama Desert in Peru, which um, lots of NGOs come from outside, <coughs> Western NGOs come and do, and you catch the mist droplets as they come in. This is an area where it never rains, and you get the mist droplets form on the fog, on the, on the blankets. They then they condensate during the sunlight, they just drip down, goes into a simple gravity feed, and then you have quite a lot of them, and it feeds quite a nice water supply into a village. Genius gets lots of like Rolex and National Geographic awards for how great it is. So she was doing a project where she put up fog catchers in Peru. And then three years later, she went back for a holiday. And uh, she went back for a holiday. She thought she'd go and visit the village where they'd put up the fog catchers. And so she went there and she walked up to the fog catchers and they'd all been slashed with machetes. And, uh, and she was like, why, why have all the fog catchers been slashed with machetes? And so she went down into the village and said to them, uh, said like, what's going on? Why have you destroyed what was a you know, totally clean, useful supply of water? And, uh, and the, the mayor took her aside and was like, because we don't want a third world technology. We want to have a pipe from the local town like everyone else. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and you, you realize that the, the social construct is absolutely essential, right? You need communities to buy into any innovation or any idea that comes up. And therefore, long-term cultural development that we witness within archaeological frameworks are essential for any adaptation or any way of changing society. And however good an idea is, if you drop it in from afar, if you do that into a society, it never really functions properly. And I think that's a very crucial thing, because in the Andes, we have plenty of ingenious traditional ecological knowledge and technological innovation, but it's a matter of how we adapt those ideas and construct them within society. And that is why I was extremely happy. So this is a man called Cesar Astuquaman, and I shared my PhD office with Cesar uh, throughout my PhD. And he was studying Inca archaeology of northern Peru. But recently, I, this, I, this is, um, I saw this Cesar last week, and until the recent change in government in Peru, he was the uh, Minister for Cultural Heritage in Peru. And then there was a shuffle, uh, because all political appointments can be short-lived, and he was moved over to the Ministry of Agriculture, or as he called it, uh, the Ministerio de Agricultura. So, so he saw it as a minor, a minor shift. Uh, uh, and the reason I was excited is because, you know, Cesar's been working for years with many of these uh, aspects of Inca agricultural technology and understanding landscape. And now he's taking on a role within the Ministry of Agriculture at a practical level of modern in infrastructure development. And so he is specifically 
taking those ideas, which he's known about for the last you know, 50 years of innovation and technology developments, the applied archaeology of innovation, but he's infusing that within the standard Ministry of Agricultural Practice within Peru. And that is the way that you can take archaeology in a meaningful way and start to infuse it within pre-existing systems of delivery within educational systems that pre-exist within a national network. And that is why archaeology can function within those ways. But that little microcosm has taken 15 years for him to do his PhD, get some of these ideas on board, rise up the, the sort of career tree, go into, the, into what he thought was going to be the right job for him as Minister of Cultural Heritage, then take a massive sidestep and go into agriculture and come up and then use his knowledge there. So you can start to see that the pathway between knowledge and understanding and implementation is never simple, but it takes time and can happen. So this is the famous photo of the signing of the Paris Agreement. Um, where 190, well, originally 196 nations got together to commit to keeping our planet at least to less than 2 degrees and hopefully to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. Overlooking the fact that there is no legally binding mechanism uh, and it doesn't start until 2020, uh, <laughs> it was a great thing and it is a great thing and it's the current great framework that we have. So how is it that archaeology can meaningfully do that? Like, is it possible for us as a community to directly engage with that at that global scale? Three months ago, I went to Scandinavia uh, because one of the big Scandinavian countries said, right, we've signed up to the Paris Agreement. Here is a very large chunk of money. We are now gonna give out this very large chunk of money to people who are going to achieve the Paris Agreement. And so they made a big call for money and they invited a huge range of different people from very different backgrounds, entirely different disciplinary backgrounds, to this meeting where we then assessed all of the different applications. And they came from economics, mathematics, architecture, theatre studies, English literature, political science. Uh, and you could see, it was an absolutely fascinating process because you could see each discipline in its own right finding their own narrative to justify how they could meet the Paris Agreements. And inevitably, everyone had a strong argument. Um, but I totally think there wasn't a single application from an archaeology uh, background. But, I, but having read large numbers of the applications and assessed them all on their individual disciplinary merits, there's absolutely no doubt that archaeology totally has the ability to communicate information to the public it has meaningful data sets that it can add to um, persuade people and it can come up with a human orientated solution. Because I think that such research clusters as um, I hope, have, have you heard of I hope here? One, okay, good, 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 good. Right, everyone votes at the end of this week. Everyone should have looked at I hope. Uh, if you do climate change and archaeology, not that it's that good, but it's quite good. So, uh, Integrated History and Futures of Peoples on Earth, uh, a modest title. It was set up by uh, Bob Costanza and, uh, and Paul Sinclair, um, and it is a fantastic collective of different research communities focused on trying to get archaeology to deal with global climate change. It is the aim is to get research clusters that tackle case studies on a regional basis and then bring together narratives onto the global stage. And if you go to the website, you will see a whole series of different projects. There's the Southwest example. There's a fantastic one on um, urban uh, gardening amongst the uh, Maya. Um, there's some very interesting range of examples. But I think that there, the narrative plays out extremely strongly that collectively, archaeologists could bring together different case studies to talk on a global stage to the community. And I hope is a recognised part of Future Earth. And Future Earth, as I'm sure many of you now know or will know, is the major overriding governing body sculpting the future of social science research funding within the UK. And that idea that Johan Rockström had back in 2008 has had a meaningful impact on the future of research funding within the UK. And I hope is now the recognised archaeological member of this future Earth future.
And so it's a very interesting way of looking at the use of archaeology in terms of research funding. So at the 2008, I was at 2009 in Copenhagen Climate Change Congress, uh, this is COP15, uh, there was a meeting just before it of all the world's top scientists uh, to provide an update to the fourth assessment report uh, and hand over that um, update to this man, who is Prime Minister Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who was then going to chair the Copenhagen climate change meeting. And at the time, I was very excited about climate change research, and I was very excited by the sort of like very energetic groups of people huddled around this conference centre who were all scientists. It all felt very contemporary and exciting that this was the latest science being developed in order to persuade this man, this evil man, that, that more needed to be done on climate change. And so the way it's structured is that each of the planetary systems, so hydrosphere, cryosphere, geosphere, um, uh, they, they get together and they have these little research clusters. And then one by one, at the end of the meeting, the four got up on stage and they presented their latest scientific results to Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who was there on, on the stage. And they said, each of them said the same thing, climate change is absolutely terrible, it's getting a lot worse, and it's your fault for not doing enough about it. <laughs> and then Anders Fogh Rasmussen got up and he gave an absolutely brilliant speech. Uh, he got up, he gave his brilliant speech, where he stood up and was like, he looked out at the entire audience of scientists and was like, I have absolutely no idea why you're having a go at me. Uh, this is absolutely not my fault. It's your fault. You guys are possibly the worst communicators I've ever met in my entire life. And if half of the electorate of my country cared about this issue enough, then I would change my views and I would do more about it. But as it is, you're not doing enough, therefore I don't need to, therefore do something about it. And, uh, and it was a brilliant speech because he, he really hit the nail on the head of like the major issue for me with climate change, which is communication. The fact is that it doesn't matter how many scientists are in the room all thinking that they're really clever and seeing like Cassandra, the future, before anyone else does. No one really will do anything about it unless you communicate change. And so for me, that was a big change as well. The Nelson one and this one were probably the two key turning points where I was like, well, communication needs to be part of it. And I still don't know who the right people are to communicate. Because for scientists to do it, it's very difficult and very dangerous because it moves us away from our pseudo-objective position of scientific analysis into a more subjective narrative building. And it's a very difficult space for us to go into. And journalists aren't really the right people to do it because they're uninformed and often have agendas. So who is, this, who is the communicators? How are we going to move the narrative? Well, one, like, the British Museum is meant to be this place, right? So I moved from academia, where I was lecturing in a department of archaeology, into the British Museum as the head of the America section. And it's still a, a largely academic role in many ways, but we do have sort of the public face there. So the British Museum is the largest visitor attraction in the UK. We get 6.8 million visitors a year. Uh, we also reach another 40 million online. So it's a big reach in terms of an audience. But how do we create narratives? Or how have I created narratives out of my research that can actually engage with that public? I think there's one thing I've learned, which is that, uh, well, which is, which is a hard lesson, but like facts make very little difference, right? If you tell people facts, which are to your face, like incredible, like, you know, we really are gonna get a lot hotter, um, and you know, sea levels are really gonna get bad. People don't listen, There's a, they, don't, they don't buy the facts. Facts don't change opinion. Opinion is what matters. People's opinions and people's worldviews are what matter. And that's a very difficult thing to try and change. But it's how, but places like the British Museum inform opinion and they inform worldview. So one of the things we do is we create exhibitions. And so what I've tried to do is work out how you feed the narratives that come out of places like I Hope and come out of the, the, the research communities from the archaeological world and feed that into a narrative of an exhibition that can actually change conceptualizations or opinion. So this is just, just a couple of examples. So this exhibition was this summer, and its starting point was resilience theory. And so it took the concept of resilience theory as developed by Buzz Holling, studying fish predation in Lake Michigan in the 1970s. 
uh, which was then picked up strongly by lots of economists in the 1980s, and the great Elena Ostrom, who then underpinned a lot of the writing of many of the IPCC frameworks. And so now resilience theory is a major theoretical framework for understanding of how the IPCC thinks when it starts to think about adaptation and transformation. So as I'm sure all of you know, resilience theory has three core concepts, but there are only three core ways of being resilient, robustness, adaptation, and transformation. So we took the case study of the peoples of the northwest coast of North America, where we've done some work and we've had long-standing relationships with many communities there going back 150 years within the British Museum. And the premise of the exhibition was the peoples of the northwest coast of North America have lived uh, culturally, genetically and linguistically for more than 10,000 years in the northwest coast. What are the lessons of cultural resilience that we can learn from these peoples? And the room was set up uh, with robustness uh, on a millennial scale on one side of the room, representing 8,000 years of archaeological history, dealing with impacts such as climate variability, environmental change, warfare, intercommunity conflicts. And then across the room, you had the paradigms of adaptation and transformation, with the corner being the arrival of Europeans when smallpox epidemics of 90% population decline um, and residential schools had meant there are some things that no community could endure with robustness. And then across the room, there was a dialogue going on as you walked down between the, the Klinkit and the Haida and the Niska, uh, the Kwakwakwak, the Salish, the Makar. As you walked down the room, the dialogue went across the room dealing with these issues of resilience, both uh, through materials and through people, through quotations and people across the room. And in this way, people not only got a sort of broad brushstrokes culture history of 10,000 years of understanding of the northwest coast of North America, but they played out in their minds this understanding of robustness. And the take home message was, you know, if my community, as my identity and my community is placed under threat, what is my mechanism of cultural resilience? Will I be robust? Will I adapt? Or will I transform? And that was the sort of take home message. And so in that way, you can start to infuse an idea you take it through an archaeological narrative, but you play it out in people's minds, not as a fact-based impartation of knowledge, but as more of a sort of journey that people then absorb and take on board as you go around. And so, yes, and uh, this is just a picture of Gwalagar Hart, uh, who is Jim Hart's son, carving a reconciliation poll, which was the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission was signed off last year, and that poll uh, was part of that, and it was raised uh, in May in the University of Vancouver. And it's an important poll, so if you have to go to Vancouver, look at that poll. Right, and then for my last example, so this is one that's more of a work in progress, really. So basically, when I started at the British Museum, which was five and a half years ago, in my interview, they said, have you got a good idea for an exhibition? And I said, yes, I do. Uh, it's going to be about climate change, and I want to do an exhibition on climate change. I then had my first week in the job, and I went and met the head of exhibitions, and they said, have you got a good idea for an exhibition? And I said, yes, it's going to be on climate change, and what we can learn about climate change from the human past. And they were like, brilliant, great. They shoved it in the schedule, and the first slot was in six years' time. <laughs> and, uh, and so I have been waiting six and a half years now to put on this exhibition. And, uh, and things move slow at the British Museum. And, uh, and so this exhibition is going to happen. They're trying to postpone it by a year at the moment. But, uh, but I'm hoping it's going to stay on slot for 2019. But it's an interesting exhibition because it plays up, like, how do you communicate directly climate change to the UK public? And that is something that I've had plenty of time to think about. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're focusing on uh, the Arctic. And the premise is that there are 400,000 indigenous peoples living around the Arctic Sea who rely on the sea ice as part of their subsistence systems and life. And that within 50 years, the sea ice will have retreated during the spring and summer from all of those communities. And therefore, what is that going to mean on the ground? Um, and the narrative of the exhibition, again, takes on a broadly cultural historical, a sort of temporal approach to the ideas of innovation and technological adaptation through the human colonization of the circumpolar north, and then throughout time periods, looking at those core concepts to play out how people have dealt with climate variability throughout the last 10 to 12 millennia, particularly in the Americas. And then try to change perspectives of landscape and of environment and of 
how people think using the uh, First Nation and Indigenous peoples of the far north that we collaborate with as part of the exhibition. And we spent a lot of time planning this, so we've had a lot of these conversations with many communities up there. And, uh, and, it's, um, and it will be a good exhibition. And we have the materiality to show it. We have the most phenomenal collections from the British Museum, uh, which can trace back those 12 to 14,000 years through the American Arctic to tell the story. But I think that as we've been developing the exhibition, I think that <coughs> I don't have any doubts that archaeology and the human past has a crucial role to play in communicating the role of cultural heritage out to a wider public. But I think how we do it is, the very, is by far the most difficult thing. How we construct narratives that take on board different opinion before we start and then try to sculpt and change opinion is a, is a very <coughs> challenging thing to do. But at its root, that is what we do as archaeologists. We take the raw data of the facts that we take out of the ground and we construct these narratives upon it that we then hold on to for dear life as we publish them. And, uh, and that is what this book, for me, really holds on to too. Within this book, there are a whole series of contributions focused on how humans are dealing with climate change, both in the current threat to cultural heritage around the world and also into the wider narratives of the social contract suggested of how we redefine our discipline in dealing with climate change. And I think that the book plays into a very strong narrative that will change over the coming decades of how archaeology as a discipline starts to engage in creating these narratives that have a wider resonance out into the public sphere. And that is a contribution that the book does and that everyone should be very proud of that achieved it. Congratulations. Questions or any questions, but I'm very happy to take questions if anyone's got any.